Welcome back from our break. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ian Sim, founder and CEO of Impacts Asset Management, Kate Murtaugh, Managing Director for Sustainable Investing and Chief Compliance Officer of Harvard Management Company, John Stroyer, President and CEO of Calvert Research and Management, and the Reverend Kirsten Spalding of Ceres. The panelists will discuss strategies that enable investors to align their portfolio with Paris Agreement goals and explore investor climate action plans. Over to you. Welcome to this session on achieving Paris aligned portfolios and developing investor climate action plans. I hope you were with us for our earlier plenary on Paris aligned portfolios, but in this session, we're gonna do a bit of a deeper dive. This is hard work. How do we actually get the portfolios moving? What are we putting into our individual investor climate action plans to implement those targets that we're, we're hearing about? We want to uh, have you come away from this session with an assessment of some of those strategies that investors are using to align their portfolios. We want to have you understand how different investors are beginning to develop and implement their robust climate action plans. And we want to examine how portfolio decarbonization strategies and reducing real economy emissions fit into fiduciary duty and um, the investor plans. So I'm delighted to have our panelists. We'll begin with Ian Sim, who's CEO of Impacts Asset Management, someone who's been working with us for many years now on this project. Looking forward to Ian's comments. You'll hear from John Stroyer, CEO of Calvert Research and Management. Calvert signed on to the Net Zero Asset Manager Initiative recently, and um, we'll hear a little bit about that commitment. And Kate Murtaugh, Managing Director of, for Sustainable Investing and Chief Compliance Officer at the Harvard Management Company. They've also made a robust commitment and are working through the hard, uh, the hard issues of implementing it. Thank you and welcome to our panelists. So thanks, Kirsten, for that introduction. I'm Ian Sim. I'm the founder and chief executive of Impacts Asset Management. We're investment managers focused entirely, actually, on the transition to a more sustainable economy. I'm Ian Sim. I'm the founder and chief executive of Impacts Asset Management. We are investment managers, and since 1998, we've been investing entirely in the transition to a more sustainable economy. So in the transition to a more sustainable global economy over the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to be facing some really exciting, um, but also some quite awesome challenges and opportunities. First of all, in the context of risk, there's going to be major physical climate risk. Physical climate risk essentially is about changing weather, changing climatic belts that are going to affect agriculture, changing uh, fire patterns, um, droughts, storms, pests, and companies are going to have to adapt there's a real risk of disruption. There's a risk that assets are going to get damaged, if not destroyed. Transition risk is actually different. So in that transition to a more sustainable economy, there will be policy interventions, new forms of taxation, for example. There'll be technology change. There'll be change in, in what consumers want to buy as well. So companies are going to have to face the risk in some areas of, of stranded assets. That's going to impact valuations, not just across individual companies' balance sheets, but also for portfolios, there's going to be real systemic risk. So that's the risk side, but actually there's going to be some enormous opportunities as well. So we're going to see a real transformation in how our power and heat are delivered. We're going to see a, the, the revolution play out fully in the uh, vehicle and transportation area, the move potentially to zero emission vehicles, electric vehicles, fuel cells. We're going to see a transformation in our food um, something we've seen only the earliest signs of. And there'll be transformation in other areas as well, potentially in our water supply um, and how we even deal with materials as well. So lots to look forward to, lots to worry about, but actually we, if we approach this positively and systematically, um, there's going to be some real opportunities for, for investors and hopefully a safe and habitable planet um, as we move forward. But impacts as analysis suggests that we're in for a much more bumpy ride, a sort of economic revolution, if you like, in many sectors, and that's going to lead to creative destruction. So it's probably a bit dangerous for us as a society today just to pressurize today's companies to be eliminating their emissions. That's probably going to lead to quite inefficient use of capital relative to 
creating new industries. Paris resilience is an idea that, or a term that we phrase, which is a slightly alternative view to deflating the carbon bubble. It's really a question of asking companies to explain how their business strategies stack up against the various climate transition scenarios, what that means for return on invested capital, what it means for risk management, what it means for the resilience of their balance sheets, which is effectively where the phrase came from. We'd also like to understand how these companies are going to be explaining to shareholders uh, and the wider public, wider society, what they're doing in this area um, and how frequently they're going to be updating their plans. So this is very much in line with the uh, task force on climate related financial disclosures or TCFD's uh, requests and, and requirements. And I think is a quite a powerful way of thinking about companies' response to, to climate transition. So Impacts was really pleased to be able to partner with Series to pull together a report just showing how various institutional investors around the world are, are responding uh, to climate change risk across their, their portfolios. And we were delighted to put our name to, to the report that, that came out in, in 2020. I think the three um, major findings, actually, we're really encouraged by the level of engagement and the energy that's, that's going into this topic from, from these institutional investors. Um, the first of those findings was really a really strong commitment amongst almost everybody in this group to, to assess and, and quantify risk of climate risk and, and actually respond to it, to, to manage it more effectively, very much in line with the TCFD requirements, many investors wanting to use and starting to use scenario analysis, developing portfolio tools, and responding um, by taking some money off the table in, in riskier assets, and in some cases, fully divesting. The second group of respondents were uh, really making long-term commitments to respond to climate change more effectively, improving their, their methodologies, um, actually using um, quantitative tools more effectively. In some cases, they want to, some, some want to reduce the carbon intensity of their portfolios over a long period of time. And for others, smaller group, but I think a growing group, there's uh, two portfolio net zero. So really eliminating uh, emissions on a net basis across their portfolio. Um, and then the third group was really committed to climate solutions, if you like. And this is, of course, where Impact Asset Management has spent over 20 years uh, focused. So in, in this group, there was uh, a real um, enthusiasm about tilting their portfolios, maybe recognizing that markets are not pricing climate opportunity correctly or risk. And so uh, wanting to invest maybe more than, than benchmark averages would suggest into those solutions. And to do that um, through passive strategies, through, through active strategies, and also to be committing to, to assessing the the results and returns from that and, and trying to find more ways of getting exposure to climate solutions. So just to conclude, there are some enormous challenges, but also some great opportunities ahead. We're all in this together. No one investment manager, no one think tank or, or specialist research group has, has got the solutions. We all need to collaborate to exchange um, our views, best practice and experience. So let's get started. I'm John Stroyer, the president and CEO of Calvert Research and Management and I'm president of the Calvert Funds. Um, we are a responsible investor. We invest across global capital markets, both equity and debt, emerging and developed markets. And we think about how companies are managing critical environmental exposures, social and societal exposures, and their governance structure in every investment we make. Delighted to be here today. Calvert did sign a net zero commitment and um, what did we sign up for and what are we actually doing? Well, right now, today, um, we've, we've committed to offset, you know, track and offset all of our emissions, which we had done before signing. So that actually wasn't new for us. Um, but signing made us undertake a process of visualizing and planning to actually eliminate carbon emissions from our business. Um, certainly, this is something that we uh, are working on in all of our investment portfolios and have for a considerable period of time. You know, what motivated us uh, to be part of this? So I think I think uh, for Calvert and you know, I joining um, and 
becoming something that's bigger than ourselves and critically important to society and, and also uh, completely consistent with our authentic culture, um, we're motivators. Uh, also, you know, making commitments that are public, um, I think matter to achieving results. Um, and it's something that's important to the organization, something that's important to our employees. Um, and of course, uh, we think we have some of the best clients in the world. Um, the fact of the matter is our clients want to see us uh, doing these things. They want to see that we in fact are um, part of driving positive change, um, part of the, the system of change and on the right side of it. So those were some of the motivators. So in a very real sense, it's a continuation um, of work that we've done for, for quite a while. Um, but I think making this commitment, putting it in writing, signing, um, you know, brings an even greater focus to the change that we need to help facilitate across the system. And, you know, um, I think there's a little bit of a double-edged sword um, signing something like this. Um, because it, it isn't actually Calvert's footprint that's going to change the world. It's, it's the bigger issues like a carbon tax, um, like policy throughout the um, regulatory system that, that governs our, our energy systems. Um, those are really the things that are going to allow us to, to meet this goal. Um, and, and, and make the difference. And I think that's, that's an important point. Um, it, individual actions matter, um, but government actions, policy initiatives, um, adjustments to the entire economic system are essential for us to get there. And that's something that, um, that, we, that we work on um, that's extremely important in achieving the goal. It's a little bit more about carbon offsets. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not something that we think is a viable long-term solution to the problem. Um, and it, you know, frankly, it's, it's, uh, you might not like this part of the answer, but it's a bit more for show um, than anything else. I think um, in addition to getting policy in terms of putting a price on carbon or a tax on carbon um, and getting the entire uh, regulatory structure that deals with utilities and the energy system moving in the right direction. The other piece that we all are thinking about today is disclosure. Um, we know that the Biden administration um, has an appetite to create a new disclosure environment so that investors can really see what's happening with carbon emissions and every aspect of ESG within issuers across the board. It's a really important issue that we're working on right now. Um, so I think part, part of this system of change is getting the necessary transparency so investors can place the right value on investments, given the assumption that we'll get a carbon tax. So in addition to regulation, carbon tax, utilities, disclosure is very important. And I think that anybody who signs the pledge has. So I think when, when we signed the pledge, we signed up to be even more active in trying to change the overall system. Um, and I think that's, it's an obligation that we've always felt at Calvert, but I think signing the pledge elevated that for us, um, created an even greater, greater priority. Many of the challenges that we face in decarbonizing client portfolios uh, are, are beginning to be met. So for instance, um, kind of across global fixed income, today we have many, many more options um, in the green bond segment or in project finance 
um, that it itself is uh, creating significant energy efficiency and decarbonizing. Um, and of course, uh, so many companies um, that we invest in are on their own journey of um, becoming more carbon efficient. Um, I think the, the, the business of getting to um, net zero in the portfolio, again, is dependent on system change um, and the um, ability to uh, transform, not just transition, but transform the energy system um, more quickly than, than most of these goals would indicate. In other words, um, it feels like everybody is putting together a uh, carbon neutral 2050 goal. Um, and I think it's very important for investors to, to ask for that. Right? This is not a time to hold back and be conservative in terms of what we're asking from the regulators in terms of required disclosure. We need to ask the regulators to get us everything we need in order to make these allocation decisions. And, and really, th this is today, now, this is the time to make that happen. I really uh, thought we'd be working on this for the rest of my life. We, we are now at a stage uh, when we can actually see that it's possible to achieve the goals that we've been working on for such a long time. Um, and therefore, the concept of rebuilding these energy systems, getting the data we need, reallocating capital, this is becoming reality. Um, I think that's something that's important for all of us um, you know, to keep in mind that you know, pushing hard to do things that might not have seemed possible even three or four years ago um, is, is productive, it's constructive. Calvert's Climate Action Plan involves measuring and monitoring um, our footprint, um, both in terms of uh, from our direct operations and even from clients who come to visit us and understand the uh, footprint in its entirety and developing specific strategies to mitigate every aspect of it in our operations. Uh, the second big part of Calvert's climate plan is to undertake the set of actions that are necessary to help change the overall system, not just through our own portfolio management activity, but also through our work with regulators in the EU and the US in terms of creating the policy changes necessary for the entire system uh, to move and to change so that our various uh, our, the, the dependencies that we have um, will not prevent us from meeting our net zero goal. Hi, my name is Kate Murtaugh and I'm the Chief Compliance Officer and Managing Director for Sustainable Investing at Harvard Management Company and we manage the Harvard University Endowment. Harvard University really decided to set a net zero pledge um, really out of recognition of the existential threat of climate risk, as well as the urgent need for immediate action. So our commitment is really a five point commitment. First is to, transact, to, to transition the Harvard Endowment to net zero GHG emissions by 2050. And that's consistent with the terms of the Paris Agreement. And we're also going to achieve this goal by considering the best scientific knowledge available, including standards set by the IPCC. And we're also embedding this commitment into our holistic approach to sustainability, including our fiduciary duty to manage risks and to achieve appropriate risk-adjusted returns for the endowment. Um, we're also working with current and prospective asset managers to um, emphasize reducing emissions in the real economy. And we're also collaborating with peer institutions who've also made or, or who are thinking about making a similar commitment to net zero. I think Harvard really um, decided to set the net zero target for the endowment because it, they really viewed it as a natural extension of the university's ongoing efforts through its teaching, its research, and its operations to prepare for and accelerate the necessary transition to a fossil fuel free economy. Um, also, there, was, there were a series of meetings among the Faculty of Arts and Sciences in 2019 that ultimately led to uh, the FAS voting on a resolution 
that was sent to the Harvard Corporation, which is the governing board of Harvard, asking that the endowment be become uh, fossil fuel free, or, and, and I should say additionally, not or, um, looking towards a, a net zero commitment as well. So the Harvard administration really felt strongly that the best way to reduce emissions in the real economy was to address both the supply side and the demand side of the fossil fuel equation. So they moved away from that binary debate over divestment to a broader commitment to net zero in the endowment. Developing the climate action plan is obviously the next, next big step that any investor needs to make. So our current focus right now and our priorities for the next few years uh, will be twofold. We're really focusing on improving data access and also on developing a methodology to estimate the carbon footprint of the investments in our portfolio. Uh, so with respect to data, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because we have both public and, and private investments. And while emissions data for public companies is fairly robust, our public markets managers rarely provide us with, uh, tr with uh, transition level transparency. And while our private managers do provide position level transparency, emissions data in the private companies is really not readily available at this point. So we're working with both our public and our private asset managers to improve access to data and to get greater transparency into the por underlying portfolio. Um, and with regarding a developing methodology, uh, we've engaged external data vendors, uh, each of which is experienced in estimating the carbon footprint of portfolios, and they're going to be assisting us with these efforts. We're a little different from public pensions in that public pensions often have a significant amount of their portfolio held directly in public equity that they manage internally. And we tend to manage our assets through external managers and we are more heavily weighted towards private investment. There's a lot of challenges as we move towards implementation. Uh, a significant portion of our endowment is invested in private assets, uh, private equity, venture capital, private real estate. Um, so I was just discussing one of the primary hurdles in the short term will be access to data from our external managers. And also a significant portion of the Harvard endowment is invested in hedge funds that pursue strategies that are uncorrelated to the broader markets. And that's you know, long short equity funds, high frequency trading, the use of complex derivatives. And currently there's really no industry consensus on how best to calculate the emissions of investments in these strategies. And any existing protocols are expected to continue to evolve over time. While some uh, pensions can think about the, think, Pensions are more likely to think about their public management first because that's a larger part of their portfolio. But for Harvard, we have a very large position in hedge funds. So this is a challenge that we're taking on earlier in our evaluation process. And finally, while we recognize that successfully executing on our net zero commitment is gonna take extensive study, thoughtful deliberation and the cooperation of a wide range of third parties, we also recognize that we don't have the luxury of time. Uh, the need to, prog uh, to progress on this initiative is imminent. And um, we'll be reporting our progress to the university leadership on a regular basis. Uh, we just released our first public climate report last week, and we'll continue to report to the broader Harvard community and to the public uh, annually. I'm really excited by the momentum that I'm seeing among other asset allocators regarding making net zero commitments. And we've had outreach from so many of our peers wanting to understand why we made this commitment and how we're gonna execute on it going forward. And the willingness of asset owners to make this commitment, realizing that they're gonna to have to figure it out as they go along, but also realizing that they need to take action immediately. Our panelists are inspiring. They have really done some of the preliminary work that all of us need to do together. So I'm uh, looking forward to having you join us. Um, consider setting your own net zero target. If you're an asset manager, or an asset owner series and, and our other investor network partners around the world can help you. We're working together through the investor agenda and you can find more about that on theinvestoragenda.org. We're calling this the Paris Aligned Investment Initiative. And whether you're starting the journey or are well advanced, there's a lot of work we can do together. So we welcome your participation. Feel free to reach out um, in the chat today or in, by email later. Um, 
I really do think that there's uh, learning from this panel, from the other sessions that you're going to be hearing and uh, on an ongoing basis. So thank you for being with us and we'll look forward to more.